Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. As COVID-19 hospitalizations in the state remain near record levels, many hospitals are turning to the Indiana National Guard for help. The last few weeks have been very difficult, and if you're calling in the National Guard, um, I feel like we need to have the message. It is all hands on deck right now. Ahead, we visit one rural Indiana hospital that's facing staffing shortages because of the pandemic. Rural child care providers have not been immune to the effects of COVID-19, but they were already facing a number of issues before the virus hit. There are people that are no longer willing to work for poverty level wages, and when that's what you're paying, it, it really caused a fundamental shift. However, new partnerships are helping address some of the challenges. And with Russian troops amassed on the Ukraine border, we talked to an expert about what could be in store for the region. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Indiana added more than 16,000 new cases of COVID-19 Thursday, pushing the total above 1.5 million in the state since the pandemic began. Nearly 75% of sampled cases are the Omicron variant, which has driven the daily average of new cases from 2,700 in November to around 12,000 this month. But there are some early positive signs. Indiana is approaching its Omicron peak. The state's two largest counties are starting to see cases drop. While this could be a good sign that things might be stabilizing a little bit, it also may be a result of delayed results coming in. The Indiana Department of Health reported 137 new deaths Thursday, pushing the state total to just under 20,000. Almost 860,000 Americans have died from COVID. Worldwide, that number is more than 5.5 million. Indiana hospitals have called on the National Guard repeatedly to provide clinical and non-clinical support as COVID-19 continues to overwhelm the health care system. Brock Turner visited one rural Indiana hospital and has this report. Hospital isolation units across Indiana are full of unvaccinated COVID-19 patients. The spread of COVID throughout this community is the worst that we have seen so far. Hospitals usually have more patients during these months, but this surge is different. In addition to high patient counts, Indiana hospitals are struggling to find workers. As a critical access hospital, um, we're not used to being at capacity all the time, so we don't staff to be at capacity. Reitz says the hospital has set records for team members out sick and quarantining, and that's not even the most challenging part. We have 60 positions posted right now because we have had so much staff resign, and it's not resigning because of the vaccine. They're resigning because they're burnt out. That's a big reason why her hospital requested National Guard support through Indiana's Department of Health. That help is made possible by the frequent extension of an executive order from Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb. A group of six National Guard members arrived in Greene County two weeks ago. Sergeant John Nelson leads them. We've got two medics, which I'm one of those. I'm a, a medic in the National Guard. And then we've got four people from other uh, Army MOSs or jobs. So the, the general support guys do environmental services, uh, We've got one right now that works with the kitchen staff, helping them. Um, we've got one that does some computer work and more clerical. And then uh, myself and the other medic at, at this particular hospital, I'm doing stuff in the ER and the lab, so doing lab draws. 
and she's uh, helping in a clinic that they have attached to the hospital as well. Nelson's team is one of 13 deployed across the state. Each has two clinical staff and four general support. Initially, teams could support a hospital for only two weeks. Last month, that time was doubled as cases surged and the number of new staff quarantined climbed. Nelson, who has served on various coronavirus-related missions during the pandemic, says this one is unlike any he's ever experienced. It's something that's happening to to family and neighbors and, and here in our state, not something that's happening 10,000 miles away. So it, it's it's definitely uh, puts all those statistics into, into view. Have you ever had a deployment like this? No. I've been in 13 years and this is the uh, the only time I've done anything like this. The members of his team echo those sentiments. For Sergeant Carrie Wascom, this deployment is unlike any other. She's from Linton, population 5400, and is thankful to help her hometown hospital. It definitely hits home, like seeing that the people that work in my community daily are struggling so much sometimes and overwhelmed. Everyone reiterated that the situation here in Linton and across Indiana is dire. It is that bad. Uh, hospitals are running out of vents. I worked in a hospital that did. We put somebody on the last vent we had. And there's people sick, severely sick with COVID, people severely sick without COVID. But the biggest fact is that we don't have the health care workers to provide the care that's needed. During our interviews, a patient suspected of having COVID-19 was transported to the emergency room here in an ambulance. The hospital has only one negative airflow room in the emergency department, and luckily it wasn't in use. Upstairs, the intensive care unit has only a handful of negative airflow rooms to minimize the risk of infection. Each of them is full. That's why an entire hallway is sectioned off. This isn't about where the virus came from. This isn't about what the virus is. This isn't about how the virus is mutating. It's about you're sick, stay home. If you get really sick and you need help, come to the hospital and we'll take care of you. Hospital executives across the state admit the level of care is different now. With record numbers of staff sick or quarantined, Reed says even her role as CEO has changed. The last few weeks have been very difficult. And if you're calling in the National Guard, um, I feel like we need to have the message. It is all hands on deck right now. So I walk the hospital in scrubs because if someone tells me they need help, um, whether it's you know, helping get a patient up from the bedside or take the ambulance that's coming in the door, I'm a nurse and I can do that. Reitz says the divisiveness that has largely defined the pandemic serves little purpose, certainly not here in the ER. All of this debate that happens, none of that is really about what happens in this room. Uh, at the bedside of the caregivers and the doctors and nurses that are right here caring for you. We are and always will be looking out for that patient's best interest and we're looking at the facts and data and the numbers that are about you. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. At the beginning of this week, the National Guard had sent teams to 30 hospitals around the state. We're joined now by Brian Tabor, president of the Indiana Hospital Association. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So we just heard about the stress COVID has put on one small rural hospital. Is it safe to say it's a story that's just being echoed across the state? Yeah, absolutely. We have 170 members uh, and I think everyone is feeling it. Uh, we're seeing the impacts of the pandemic, not just with patients with COVID, uh, but patients whose health has declined because care was put off. Uh, we're seeing the effects of COVID, uh, really the pandemic and the length of this pandemic on Hoosiers' mental health as well. So our behavioral hospitals are, are also very busy. And we're about to enter a third year of the pandemic. How do you keep that morale up for those that are on the, the front lines there? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's hard. Uh, it, it, it's hard to keep morale up. Uh, we're doing everything that we can. I think some of the, the resources that have come from the federal government, uh, there have been some teams that have uh, come to Indiana, uh, the National Guard, the, the resources that the state has helped deploy. That's a morale booster. I think it says to those men and women that are on the front line in Indiana's hospitals that, uh, that the policymakers and, and leaders do recognize how much they need that help right now. And so I think that's a morale booster to have some of that support and get a little break from those folks. 
And uh, we're also doing what we can to provide uh, behavioral health services and mindfulness exercises, other things that we can do, anything we can do to help improve resilience right now, um, we're trying to do. Do you worry about the long-term effects too? I'm talking, you know, post COVID, hopefully that happens on uh, hospitals due to the, you know, the burnout and so many nurses and doctors that we hear that are leaving the industry. Oh, absolutely. I, I think the healthcare workforce is gonna have to be rebuilt in a significant way. And a nurse leader recently said that there was a, a projection or a report that came out that speculated we may need five years to get back to 75% of the healthcare workforce that we had before the pandemic. And, and that was a couple of months ago. That was really before this latest surge. So I think that's optimistic. I think it's gonna be more difficult than that. So we need help from policymakers, uh, uh, other stakeholders to help us increase the healthcare education pipeline um, to help celebrate our caregivers and everything that they've gone through because we're going to really need to uh, completely rebuild the workforce. All right, Brian, we're out of time right now. Thank you so much for being on the show. I know you have a lot going on. Appreciate your time. Th thanks again, Joe. The Indiana House voted this week to effectively block private companies from enforcing COVID-19 mandates. The measure says business have to grant exceptions from getting the vaccine to employees who request them on a medical or religious basis or who have contracted the virus within six months. Democratic Representative Ed Delaney says the bill is justifying the anger of a few at the expense of many. This attack is led by those who proclaim their love and devotion to the private sector. Leave them alone. Leave the businesses alone. The measure also says if someone is fired after requesting a COVID vaccine exemption, they can receive unemployment benefits. The bill now heads to the Senate. Dr. Jerome Adams says he's concerned about the potential for another HIV outbreak in southeast Indiana now that Scott County has closed its needle exchange. Adams is the former state health commissioner and U.S. Surgeon General. He praised the county's needle exchange for keeping HIV cases low and connecting drug users to recovery services. But he says many drug users won't be connected with those services anymore. The simple truth from a purely scientific point of view is that all the ingredients still exist in Scott County for us to have another very rapid and very large explosion of HIV. There are efforts underway to start a privately run needle exchange in the county, but the timeline for when it would be approved and operational is uncertain. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. With Russian troops amassed on the Ukrainian border, we talk to an expert about the threat being posed to democracy in the region. And rural child care providers were already facing a number of challenges before COVID, and they have only increased during the pandemic. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Wake up. Wake up to the world. To the marvels. The mayhem. The music. Wake up to the wows. The woes. The wonder. Wake up to the commotion. To the beauty. To the humanity. To the hope. Wake up every morning, fully awake. NPR Morning Edition. Tune in to your local station or download the NPR app. Year after year, PBS has been bringing you the news you trust. We care about the things that are going to affect the lives of each and every American. The in-depth analysis you need. What we normally see in these big crises. And the true stories that have to be told. We're a place that people can come not just to find out what happened, but why it matters. It's all thanks to the support of viewers like you. Thank you, and stay tuned to America's most trusted network. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Tension is mounting every day between Ukraine and Russia as the Russians have assembled around 100,000 troops of the countries at the country's border with Ukraine. The White House has sent U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to meet with Ukrainian leaders, his Russian counterpart, and NATO allies in an effort to defuse the situation. President Biden said that if Russia invades Ukraine, imposing sanctions would be effective in curtailing Russia's aggression. 
We're joined now by Carissa Jackson for more on the situation. She's the senior program officer for Freedom House, pro-democracy organization that tracks threats to freedom globally and mobilizes support for human rights defenders. Welcome to the show, Carissa. Thank you for having me. So Freedom House lists Ukraine as partly free and as a transitional or hybrid regime. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, so every year Freedom House publishes Freedom in the World, which measures the state of freedom and democracy globally. We use multiple indicators to assign each country or territory a status of free, partly free or not free. Ukraine is a democratic and relatively free country. They've made some great progress on democratic reform since 2014, though there are some quite powerful, corrupt special interests pushing back on that. There's an incredibly vibrant civil society and activist community that is fighting very hard for democratic progress and human rights. Ukraine is a democracy, however imperfect. Its people made it clear that they want to keep that democracy and expand their freedoms. They want to align more closely with Western Europe and not live under Putin's shadow. So how important is it for the Ukrainian people that the country not fall back under that umbrella of Russia? Very. Putin is trying to have veto power over the decisions of a sovereign state. Ukraine's future should be decided by Ukrainians, full stop. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014 and has been occupying Crimea and the Donbass for eight years. More than 10,000 Ukrainians have died in the Donbass, not to mention the internally dis displaced people. You've also got activists, lawyers, and monitoring groups taking great risks to work in the occupied territories providing legal aid and advocating for the rights of political prisoners, among other things. The people of Ukraine are fighting very hard for their freedom, which they would lose under Russian control. Is there, or is it, would you say there's a concern that if Ukraine is invaded, that other democracies in the region, which were under the old Soviet empire, could be at risk too? Yeah, it's, it's obvious that Putin feels threatened by democratic progress in neighboring countries like Ukraine, Georgia, and Armenia. The Kremlin views democratic openings on its borders as an obstacle to its continued authoritarian control of Russia. And things are not going well domestically in Russia, polit politically or economically or with the pandemic. Putin is probably using this aggressive posturing to distract and intimidate the Russian people with the Kremlin's propaganda narrative, which is that the West is bent on destroying Russia, which is just not the case at all. When discussing the unrest in Kazakhstan last week, Putin explicitly stated that he wouldn't allow so-called color revolutions to take place. We just have about 30 seconds left. Can you briefly tell me more about Putin's broader efforts to spread authoritarianism outside of Russia? Yeah, I would say like the worst is the transnational repression, which is what we call it when governments reach beyond their borders to target their critics living abroad. For example, when the Kremlin reached all the way to Salisbury, UK, to poison Sergei and Yulia Skripal with a Novichok agent in 2018, and then when they did the same thing last year in Germany to Alexei Navalny, the famous dissident and anti-corruption activist that Time magazine just called the man Putin fears, and then just last year when the Belarusian government forced a Ryan airplane on its way from Greece to Lithuania to land in Belarus so that they could arrest and detain a dissident Belarusian journalist named Roman Patrasevich. Like all of these are, are signs of this transnational repression. Carissa, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. COVID-19 has only added challenges many child care providers face, especially in rural areas. New partnerships are helping some address challenges like staffing and funding to make more high quality care available in their communities. But Indiana Public Broadcasting's Jeannie Lindsay reports, rural providers are mostly on their own. The sounds coming from inside Perry Preschool and Child Care on this brisk fall morning suggest just how hectic things are today. Two staff called in and a third is taking a pre-planned day off. Paige Shank is the chief financial officer for the Tell City Electric Department, but today she's using vacation time to volunteer at the center. So I was in an eight o'clock meeting, the meeting got over, told my boss. Thankfully, he's very, very understanding. 
and I've been here the last three hours <laughs> in ratio. That ratio is important. Licensing rules limit the number of kids per staff member in each room. Without Shank here, the center would have been forced to turn families away at the door this morning. It's happened before. The world stops and you're like, this is way more important than I thought it was at first. It's Aaron, what's up? No, nope, that's just fine. Aaron Emerson is the president of the Perry Preschool and Child Care Board. There's a sense of despair and exhaustion in her voice as she describes what it's been like running the center lately. COVID added an entirely new layer of difficulty to something that was already impossibly difficult. Essentially, it boils down to two things, a lack of financial support and a complex web of licensing rules. And that makes it tough to find and keep staff. In Perry County, fingerprinting for potential hires is done just once a week. Emerson says that means in some cases, it could take at least a month to process everything. And for nine bucks an hour, people aren't sticking around anymore. There are people that are no longer willing to work for poverty level wages. And when that's what you're paying, it really caused a fundamental shift. It's just one example of how limited services in the rural county come with major consequences. Unpredictable closures mean working parents like Shank have to lean on their workplaces and family members. Some parents quit their jobs. One family is considering selling their house to move somewhere with more or any options. Emerson doesn't blame families for wanting to leave. It's difficult to find solutions for everything it takes to keep the center open. It's really exciting when you get a center going and you raise the money to get it up and going and you open the doors and you feel like you've solved it. But that is only the beginning and you still have to figure out how to keep it in operation every single day according to licensing guidelines while also running a tremendous annual operating loss. Look at me, you have milk splattered on your- Some people think the answer is finding more ways to share the load. Ah. Adam Alson is the board president of Appleseed Childhood Education in Jasper County, which plans to open a center in 2022. He says strong partnerships are why it can work. A local community foundation provided startup funding. An experienced child care nonprofit will manage the center. And that allows board members to focus on raising money because rural child care doesn't make money. It's Appleseed's responsibility to find the building, which we have. And it is um, our responsibility to fund the annual operating loss that the center will generate. Allison says government funding and a review of licensing rules specifically for rural child care could help other centers like Perry stay open. But ultimately, he says it's up to rural communities to decide if they want it or not. At the end of the day, federal funding doesn't get to rural areas. State, state funding doesn't necessarily get to rural areas in Jasper and Newton counties. And so in order for us to solve this problem, we have to solve it locally. Paige Shank, the CFO from Perry County, agrees. And she says without local support, it won't just be Perry Preschool and Child Care at risk of closing for good. You have to support the kids of the community if you want your community to grow. Because if you're not growing, you're dying. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Jeannie Lindsay. Purdue University has kicked off a project to learn how best to diversify crops grown in the U.S. Corn Belt. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports the idea is to make farms in states like Indiana more resilient to extreme heat, flooding, and natural disasters. When a farmer grows just one or two crops, it's easier for a single weather event to wipe out their entire field. Researchers with the Diverse Corn Belt Project are hoping to engage with hundreds of farmers in Indiana, Iowa, and Illinois to find out the best ways to diversify what they grow. Eight years ago, Liz Brownlee and her husband started slowly converting her 100-acre family farm from corn and soybeans to diverse pasture land, native grasses, and pollinator habitat. All those different types of plants are bringing up minerals from the soil. They're capturing sunlight in different ways. They're growing best at different times of the year. And so there's always food for our animals because we've planted a diversity of plants. Purdue researchers say one of the main reasons farmers continue to grow corn and soybeans despite losses is the fact that those crops receive more federally subsidized insurance. So it's very, very rational for farmers to continue to farm only corn and soybeans because of that guarantee from the federal government. Um, and, and we're arguing that that's really not the best thing for farmers or for, for the country, quite frankly. 
For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. Farmers can find out how to participate in the project through this story page on our website. Gamblers in Indiana wagered nearly $4 billion on sports last year. As Mitch Legan reports, the state's sports betting industry found its footing after a rocky 2020. Hoosiers bet $3.8 billion on sports last year, more than double 2020's total. The betting blitz netted the state about $29 million in tax revenue, according to Play Indiana, which tracks the state's gambling industry. Play Indiana managing editor Jake Garza says the numbers are up because the pandemic upended sports leagues. They had to pause, shorten, or cancel their seasons in 2020. The first full year sports gambling was legal in Indiana. Hoosiers could only bet on, you know, Korean baseball and table tennis in Belarus for a while there, which really took a hit to the numbers. If not for the pandemic, 2020 might have looked a lot more like 2021 in terms of the overall money involved. True to its reputation, basketball was Indiana's favorite sport, followed closely by football. Notre Dame sports squads and the Indianapolis Colts were Hoosiers' favorite teams to bet on. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.